Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 35. Today I sit down with Rosa Del Duca, Clifton Hicks, Ramon Meja, and JJ Rodriguez to discuss conscientious objectors in the U.S. military. To include some of the major motivators that push them to do it, what tips they might offer to someone else in their shoes, and the resources they use to get through their time in service. When I made it to my home place, I found triumph of the will. Where once lay a shining city, stood a fortress on a Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 35. Today I sit down with Rosa Del Duca, Clifton Hicks, Ramon Meja, and JJ Rodriguez to discuss conscientious objectors in the U.S. military. To include some of the major motivators that push them to do it, what tips they might offer to someone else that's in their shoes, and the resources they used to get through their time and service. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 35. Today I sit down with Rosa Del Duca, Clifton Hicks, Ramon Meja, and JJ Rodriguez to discuss conscientious objectors in the U.S. military. To include some of the major motivators that push them to do it, what tips they might offer to someone else in their shoes, and the resources they use to get through their time in service. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. For those new to the show, Danny and I are two progressive veterans who take the military and veteran stories of the day and add some much needed context. Well, welcome everybody to our, uh, our Conscientious Subjectors uh, panel. Um, like to give a real quick disclaimer for, uh, for JJ, the one that uh, Danny usually gives. Um, and that is that uh, none of us speak for the Department of Defense or the Army in our opinions. We're giving our, our unofficial personal opinions in what we're, what we're sharing today. Um, conscientious objection is something that most people have zero experience with. Um, and I think that that's really a shame. And the greatest numbers historically have usually been in wars that have had the draft. And I had mentioned to the guys here when we were talking a little bit ago that, um, you know, these days DOD get, or I, I think it was the army actually, excuse me, army gets, you know, maybe 50 applications a year and they approve maybe half of them. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about today is I want to talk about the human cost. I want to talk about the personal things that, that pushed on us and the leaders that affected us, whether positively or negatively. Um, and so to start us off, um, I want to talk about our collective motivations to join the military, because I think those are the part of the really important building blocks for coming a conscientious objector. Um, and the question would be, if you could give one sentence as to the greatest motivation that caused you to join, what would that be? And since I get to pick on everybody today, uh, I'm going to start us off. Um, I had two major motivations in, in joining the Army. One was to pay for college. Um, at the time, I had uh, vast dreams of working for some kind of three-letter agency, probably law enforcement, and I knew that I needed college to make that happen. I saw how hard my parents worked. I knew that they would try to help me with college, but um, we weren't well off, and I, I didn't want to burden them in that way. The second motivation was a career one. I came from a small town where people told me all the time that, being in the military was great. You get a regular paycheck, you get 30 days leave a year. And that came mostly from people that had no experience with the military, but it, it really did color how I saw it at the beginning. And I think those, it, it, it gave the idea of the military a legitimacy and, and it gave me a confidence that I shouldn't have had. 
And I think those unchallenged assumptions are really gross. You know, like, quote, the, uh, the military are professionals, end quote. Well, they're usually only professional when people are looking. Uh, but, quote, but when people aren't looking, they'll behave themselves, right? End quote. No, that's when the truly horrendous stuff happens, when service members believe that other people aren't looking. So here is my biggest unchallenged assumption, and it was I went there to help, but I didn't help anyone, not, not, in, not in the abstract, not in actually making their country better. We went there, we call, and we called murdering innocent people the, the cost of freedom when nothing could be further from the truth. So, um, Rosa, I'm going to pick on you first. What, what would you say was some of your main motivations to join, and, and have you observed any assumptions that that came with? Uh, yeah, sure. So I joined, it was in 2000, November of 2000. Uh, so I was really looking for a way to pay for college and maybe have some, some little adventures, either fighting forest fires. I was, I joined in Montana, the Montana National Guard or, um, traveling to Germany two weeks a year in the summer. And I, I had no family history of military service in my family. I didn't know anybody. So I, really didn't I, I had no experience with it but when the national guard recruiter came in unlike the army and the marines maybe the navy guy you know i didn't want to do something full-time i wanted to you know do something part-time and pay for college and it seemed like an ideal situation you know one week in a month two weeks a year that's awesome you do the math it's like 90 percent civilian 10 percent soldier um so those were some of the <laughs> assumptions I went went in with and then you know a year later everything drastically changed no I I, I listened to your um, to your first episode yesterday and there was one comment that you made that I that I, I I'm not sure if, if it was you quoting yourself or this was from one of your sisters but um, I was going to get college paid for and I'd be free in six years and you know, it, it, I, I remember having those kind of thoughts, you know, that, that maybe join the National mm -hmm. Guard, no big deal. And in Oregon, we fight forest fires too, but also floods. And so you know, not, not a bad thing. And then the whole thing changed. But the reality is that it was only the politics of the time that really had the change. We just, no one pointed it out to us. You know, no one, it, it, they can go at any time. That's something Danny and I talk about pretty often is that the Orders can be rewritten, MOSs can be changed, assignments can be thrown in the garbage can. Um, there's a lot of control that they don't talk about. And oh, oh, exactly. Yeah, they don't. They they tell you, you know, you have all these options. Like, oh, you got a that high score on your ASVAB, you qualify for all of these jobs. You can pick whichever one you want. But then, you know, it's whittled down to what units are near you and what MOSs are open there. And then they, they get you by saying, oh, you, you can always transfer into another MOS whenever you exactly. want. Exactly, yeah. But that's not true either. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, a, a National Guard recruiter that I dealt with um, told people that if they enlisted in the National Guard and didn't like it, that he had a way of uh, discharging them so they could join a different branch if they wanted to. And so that kind of, it made him kind of the Pentagon of recruiters. It's like, I can give you anything you want. And I never checked with anybody to see if it was right or if he actually was able to make it happen. I'm guessing not. Um, but they, yeah, it's this, it's this wide open, gorgeous apple pie to eat. And then when you finally get to the pie tin, it's like a few crumbs left if there ever was a pie there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like pie. I, I, I just, it just seemed apt. Um, <laughs> so how about you other guys, uh, Clifton, JJ, um, it, 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 were there any other, were there things on the way in that, that you've kind of noticed on the back end here that, that really told you something without proof, so to speak? Clifton, you can go if you want. Um, okay. Uh, so reasons for joining, um, for me, it was, uh, I have actually a long family history of being in the military. 
So coming up, I kind of figured that I would, that it was, uh, I, I was going to do it anyhow. And then the uh, September 11th attacks happened. And so I, for sure, I got real fired up over that. I got caught up in that, um, like a lot of people and, uh, was hell bent on going then. Whereas before I maybe wanted to be in military intelligence or maybe I was going to join the Navy or something. After September 11th, I decided to go combat arms because I was real eager to, to like get revenge and all, all that stuff. Anything that yeah. a 17 year old wants, you know? Uh, so, and so that was, you know, it, it started out as family tradition and then it turned into, you know, just an intense desire to fight. I wanted to fight and kill and all that stuff. Um, and then sort of the third lurking background reason was that there were no other options for me. I had uh, dropped out of high school and got a, uh, had homeschooled myself so I could get a diploma just so I could join the army. Otherwise I never would have done that. I didn't want to go to college. And, but there were no other options for me. And it was convenient that a war happened and I wanted to fight. So that's, that's what I did. It, all, it was an honor thing. You know? It seemed like the only honorable option for someone like me was military service. No, I, I, I come from a family of, of military service as well. And um, I remember as a little boy looking at my, my grandfather's medals and Again, it, it, admiring them, but not analyzing the cost, you know, that, and as, and as kids, we don't do that. You know, we see things and we, we love our, our, our veteran relatives, whoever they happen to be. We don't always move those out, but I know that my strong family lineage of service definitely played a, played a role in me joining. And then, like you said, with the, um, with September 11th, the calculus changed, you know, that, that the, um, you know, I, uh, I tried to enlist as a ranger and, uh, thank God I have, uh, I have a color vision issue. So I got to be an MP and I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I certainly didn't think that way at the time. Um, but I'm really, I'm really grateful that, um, um, that that turn of events happened in the way it did, or my experience would be very different. Um, so JJ, were you going to say something, brother? No, no. I was just, um, I was going to tell my story if you, if you're wrapping up. Go for you, it, man. Yeah. So I, when nine 11 happened, I was in first grade. So <laughs> I can't say that that's what fired me up to join the military. <laughs> um, Damn. But, uh, not to make y'all, I'm sorry, not to make y'all feel <laughs> a certain way. <laughs> um, but I was in a military family, so I knew that that meant my dad was a military, you know, career officer. So I knew when that happened, even th at that age, that he was going to be gone and he was going to go to war. And it was a terrifying thought for me, you know, having that personal investment in it. Um, but I, I, I was invested in, you know, the what some people would call the propaganda now, but um, I was all about it, like. It, going, going into high school, I wanted to go to West Point, um, and that was like my dream all throughout high school. And uh, that was it. Like my reason for initially joining was my father's service. You know, try to follow his legacy or continue his legacy, and uh, wanting to serve my country. Um, so I got into West Point, and that's when I started. Just started questioning um, sort of the the base assumptions of uh, some of that propaganda I mentioned earlier um, of uh, service to country and whatnot. I mean, I graduated West Point in 2016. It's 2019 now, and I feel like I haven't been of service to any person on earth. <laughs> like, um, I don't know, maybe I made a couple dollars for some defense industry folks, but that's about it. So that's where I'm at. Um, like I said, I started questioning the, the, the assumptions at West Point, but I still graduated, got through, and uh, came to Fort Campbell here to an infantry unit. And some of the, uh, some of the commentary that the people around me were, were, were talking about with relation to war um, really made me 
start to double down on these questions because I'd already heard some of it at West Point. Obviously, you know, people try to hype themselves up. My dad calls it bravado, but it's, it's I don't think it's pretty. It's natural to be talking about blowing people's heads up, you know, in a in a kind of ha ha way. <laughs> Um, so obviously an infantry battalion, they're going to talk like that. And it got to really got to a point of crisis and January, 2018, thank goodness. I got in contact with another conscientious objector, a buddy of mine by the name of Matt Malcolm. He put his, um, packet in right after West Point. He was a classmate, uh, at West Point, but. And he talked me through the process and I was like, this is it for me. I'm doing that January, 2018. So February, 2018, I had finished all the, the packet and turned that in. It's been a year now and I'm just now finishing up the, the process. Do you have any idea how much longer do you think? So I'm in contact with a uh, Quaker house out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Great people. They've helped me throughout the whole process. Um, they say that, once it reaches the Department of the Army Conscientious Objector Review Board, it should be two to three months. So hopefully, maybe the next six, under six, somewhere yeah. in there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that same buddy, Matt Malcolm, um, he said that once it got to that point, the DA Review Board, it took about 11 months. So anywhere Ooh. between two and 11 months. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm still going to keep my fingers crossed for you. I hope it, I hope, I hope it goes, uh, I hope it goes quickly. Um, so the next thing I wanted to, next question I wanted to throw out there was about the first leader that you told that you wanted to apply to be a CEO. And, you know, we're the, I would think most of us, you know, you'd want to pick somebody that might seem favorable to it, but, you guys may have been in situations where there wasn't, where there wasn't someone that seemed trusting enough that you could ask for advice or even just say, this is what I want to do now. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I had any NCOs or officers when I was in that I would have been able to do that with, but I want to hear from you guys, you know, did any of those experiences color how you moved forward with your, with your packet and with your end, end of time in the military? Um, well, I'll, I'll start off, I guess. Um, so for me, so I was in a cavalry squadron. We had just got back from Iraq when I decided that I had to do this. Um, and there was, of course, you know, there was absolutely no helping hand, of course. And also, you know, in, in their defense, they, nobody, they were completely ignorant of not just the process but all, uh, they didn't even know there was a regulation covering it. They, and also they were all ignorant um, of what a conscientious objector even was. They didn't even have a definition for it. Everybody thought that it, it, it was to some kind of pacifist or something, which it could be. But um, so for me, um, it was a whole big process. And this was in late 2004, or early 2005. I was on a, a relatively, what I would call a relatively remote, small base in Germany. There was only 800 of us on the base and no females, for example, and nobody over the rank of lieutenant colonel. So there was not a lot of like oversight and the chain of command kind of got away with a lot more than I think maybe they would on a bigger base and uh, stuff like that. So I knew about um, like the inspector general hotline and stuff like that. So they, you know, I was, I was always calling up the inspector general and raising hell. And uh, so they, they, they knew I was a troublemaker and stuff. And they, and it was sort of became known that I wasn't going to go back to Iraq. Um, but so the whole I'm leading up to is there was no internet on our base. So there was really, oh, shit. it was really difficult for, there was internet in the, in the NCO barracks which I didn't have access to. I was, I had just been demoted to E1 and it just clawed my way back up to E3. So I was nowhere near the internet on the NCO barracks. And, but fortunately for me, um, when I'd gotten in trouble in Iraq, which is a whole separate story, when I got in trouble, they pulled me off of my tank. I was in a tank platoon. They pulled me out of that, put me in headquarters. So now I worked back in Germany in the orderly room and I had access to the internet because I was an office worker all of a sudden. 
So only because of that, I was able to type in, I said, there's got to be, I started researching on the internet and somehow, I don't even remember how, but I pulled up the army regulation covering conscientious objection, which if I'm not mistaken, it's AR 600-43. So I pulled that sucker up, hit the damn print button, and on the tax dollar, you know, printer machine printed out the whole thick regulation. <laughs> um, so I went home that night and I read it cover to cover. And then I think, you know, the next night I read it cover to cover again. So I read the damn thing twice and I finally figured out that I qualified as a conscientious objector on moral grounds, not on religious grounds. Um, so I got the application, the initial application together, which I remember just maybe being a, a couple pages or something that you initially put in. You have to have a big statement and then maybe a questionnaire or something like that. And you had to turn it in. I think you're supposed to turn it into your supervisor or something or I mean, some kind of leadership person. I didn't know who the hell to give it to. And I tried to give it to my immediate supervisor, who was uh, an E5, not a bad guy, nice guy, but he was terrified to touch it. So he actually refused to accept it. So I had to go, I just went over everybody's head. And um, after, uh, after hours, one evening in the orderly room there, I slipped over to the troop commander's office, a captain, and I slipped the application in his inbox on his desk. <laughs> and so he directly got it. And, and then the next morning when he's going through his stuff, all hell kind of broke loose over that, you know? Um, but so the process, there really, there weren't any leaders. There was only one act, act leader who actively obstructed the, the process and actively tried to provoke me into getting in trouble so that he could, anytime I was facing a UCMJ process that they, they stopped the packet at that point if you're if you're under under any kind of investigation or if you're an article 15 process your co packet gets put on hold and he figured that out and this was by our first sergeant who was a real you know cowardly bastard type guy um and he figured that out and then he actively tried to provoke me and put me in situations and and even um flat out framed me one time but anyhow Long story short, my process only took eight months, and that was after being significantly delayed several times because of that that one individual. And the one other quick thing I'll I'll, I'll say before I stop talking is um, there was really two kinds of leaders that I noticed, and of everybody who had been with the unit and gone to Iraq, all of those leaders, my troop commander, you know, my uh, my immediate supervisor, the executive officer of our troop. Um, on up the line, even up to the sergeant major and those guys, anybody who had been with the unit in Iraq was was neutral about it. You know, they were like, oh, you I, I could totally understand why you wouldn't want to do this anymore. And uh, yeah, you should you, you should probably be out of the army or they were hostile, you know, in their support. Like, oh, you you know, oh, you're like a coward now. You don't want to fight. Well, get the hell out. But yeah, the two leaders in my chain of command who. Um, who had not been with the unit in Iraq and in fact hadn't deployed anywhere at all. There was a Lieutenant and that first Sergeant, they had never been anywhere before. They were just vicious uh, yes. and insulting and obstructive the whole time. Mm. But so there, you know, at no point was there a favorable NCO, somebody who was not, uh, at least fair with you, if not understanding or accepting, but they treated you fairly. But you know, the, my troop commander treated me fairly. Uh, good to know. Yeah, he, he was cool. And he had, you know, he had, he had been with the unit before and he was actually a good dude. Um, and eventually down the line, a few months later, that first Sergeant, um, it was a long story, but he got in a lot of trouble and he got, um, he was about to get his, get his first Sergeant rank. He was still in E7. And so they, they, they screwed him over on that, prevented him from getting, from getting the first sergeant rank, and he was out of our troop. And then we got an actual first sergeant in, and then that guy was really cool, really good guy and supportive of it. So I was, I was lucky in that regard. And like all the enlisted people around me, all, all of them who'd actually been to Iraq, understood 100% what I was doing. And, and if not supported it, they were neutral about it, you know they understood what I was doing 
and they agreed that I should be gone. That's a, it's a real careful dance that people try to do there that they, they want to protect their career, but they feel conflicted about what's happening, you know, and, and I, um, I guess uh, thankful for that the, uh, some of the services, some of the resources, you know, being able to, you being able to print that thing out, you know, it, it had things been happening and you still been in Iraq and you wanted to stop it. it you wouldn't have access to information. You wouldn't have be able to look up resources or anybody to call or any, anybody who had been through it before who could give you a, a tiny bit of advice, you know? Absolutely. And there was one other guy in my squadron who before the deployment, he tried he tried to do it too. He was denied. And of course, he had access to zero information. He wasn't able to get on the internet, you know, like I was able to do. Yeah. No, I looking at the regulation yesterday, I noticed it hasn't been updated since 2009. Yeah. And the, um, like you said, you know, there's no, no one in a specific size unit, company, battalion, wherever gets trained or certified in any part of that. You know, they, they read the regulation, it's passed off to the um, investigating officer and um, who you, you hope you get an impartial one. So um, before, uh, before I go on to the next thing, did anybody have anything else they wanted to share? Any, uh, stories about leaders supportive or, or not terribly not supportive, anything like that? Sure. I'll, I'll share a little bit. Um, but, uh, first of all, Clifton, your story is just incredible and your strength of will to get that done just amazes me. But I, I agree. Like when I turned in my packet, they had no idea what to do with, you know, uh, turn it in. My, my story is like, it's kind of complicated because I, I was called up in 2004, but the ROTC recruiter at my school found out somehow, called me and said, hey, if you join uh, ROTC, you can finish your college degree. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm not in ROTC. But he's like, yeah, you can join at the last minute, which is what I did. So I got myself in a real pickle by signing a um, in the guard to do ROTC so at, the whole problem was I had no idea that conscientious objector existed I thought it only applied to the draft in Vietnam where people burn their draft cards that would make a lot of even sense even though I was a conscientious <laughs> yeah, I, I probably was a conscientious objector maybe in 2002 or 2003 just because as a journalism major in school, I was really paying attention to how the war unfolded and what troops were saying when they came home and things going on. And then I started listening to Democracy Now!, which told a whole what the mainstream media was telling. So I just was growing more and more disturbed about what I was hearing and seeing in the news. Well, I, I was a conscientious objector until like I still had to go through out processing or to I had to go through the motions to deploy even though I had sneaked into ROTC at the last minute and it was on, there at that appointment on some paperwork I saw this little box that said are you a conscientious objector and it was like you know fireworks in my brain like of course that that is exactly what I am that's what I am um, you know like I'm not just you know, depressed and conflicted and, you know, regretful of signing up. Like, I'm a conscientious objector. Like, I am object to this war on multiple grounds. But I had just signed, you know, that contract extension, just joined ROTC. So I tried to suck it up for, and maybe lasted another six, six months before I started researching it more, came across the GI rights hotline. And by that time, by the time they sent me that whole huge army regulation that Clifton talked about, um, I was due to go to LDAC, which is the leadership development advanced camp or whatever, where you um, learn to be, it's like the first of two things that ROCT officers have to go through. <laughs> so I had to go through that training, like the secret 
conscientious objector, like thinking about how I'm going to write my, my big long essay for my application. And I was doing it on moral grounds too. I mean, I wasn't religious at all still. And I'm still not. And it's a lot harder to prove your, your beliefs that way. And that's the, the wording is that you have to prove, which is ridiculous because how can you prove your beliefs? You can, you can state them, you can argue them, you can talk about them, explain them, but I, I don't know about proof. It's not like, you know, um, nothing tangible that you can show someone. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even, you know, letters and diaries and letters of support, uh, it's not proof. It's, it's convincing of like convincing documents, but anyway, so, so when I finally, um, got my packet already, because the GI rights told me that that's what I should do. I should get everything absolutely perfect before I turn it in. And they thought that I needed to turn it into the ROTC side, not the national guard side. So, you know, I, it was something that I was dreading for months and months and months. But when I finally went there, the, I was really impressed with how the major handled it. Like I could tell he wasn't happy and he was like more exhausted than anything that I came in there and said, and told him, you know, like I have something to tell you. I'm sorry that I didn't tell you sooner, but I was advised not to. And then I, you know, you could just see him just like harden and be like, Oh shit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a conscientious objector. I'm going to be applying for a discharge. And I took out this big binder, you know, uh, and he didn't let me give it to him because like, you know, first of all, are you sure? Second of all, I don't think I even handle this and I need to do a lot of research to find out what do I do with it. And he was pretty sure that the national guard side handled it, but they didn't, it did. And I think that is odd to go through the ROTC side, but he was, and I, I thought that everyone and all the cadets would know. And I still had to go to class with these people and, and uh, PT sessions and all that stuff and labs. But I think he only told the other instructors and one of them gave me a real ass chewing and, you know, told me to with, withdraw my application and I was making a big mistake and, you know, it's a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. But the one in charge of the ROTC program at the school I was going to was very level headed and professional about it. And I am really grateful for that because it, it's super stressful and the stigma for angles of life is, can be overwhelming. Yeah. Absolutely. You, uh, when you find yourself in that place where you know that you don't belong anymore and you're, you're waiting for people's eyes, you know, you, you're waiting for what you perceive is going to be their, their judgment. And, um, you know, even without people talking about the idea of it, you know, that, that especially among, uh, the men in the military that, you know, did you fight hard enough? Did you do this hard enough? Even if you, you hadn't. And there's that, those, those questions of whether or not your, your comrades see you as a legitimate soldier, you know, and, and the things that go into that. Um, but being, you know, saying right there is I'm not going to fight. I understand you guys have to fight, but I'm not going to, it's the, it really, really crystallizes for people. You know, it, 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 hearing you guys talk, it seems like that the people's response fits into a, just a few categories. You have people that were, um, you know, they were kind of right in the middle that they understood, but they could not support you. They could not, you know, be out and about about it. There were the people that, this is number two, that, that uh, like that instructor that you just mentioned, that they, you know, remove it, take it back. There's no way you can't, you can't say that. That's not, you know, how could you be that without understanding that it's about your morals, not theirs and, and the armies. It's also not about the army's morals either. We spend so much time hearing about the army values and all that shit. And, but we don't ever actually work on learning the values. They're not, you know, they're not crystallized for us as things that are actually helpful. So, um, so a big step in the process of becoming a, a CEO is the investigative officer. And um, I'd like to hear from you guys if you have any impressions on 
dealing with them through your process? Um, you know, were they, were they accommodating? Were they assholes? Um, you know, that, that, um, that, because it seems that there can be a lot of, a lot of, uh, subjective ideas when it comes around to that, which officer is chosen and how they decide to do it. And so, but, um, go for it. Um, when, with my experience, I kind of was, he was clear sailing for me. It was, uh, he was a young captain who worked at, at brigade. He just got selected. Didn't, he didn't know anything, you know, had never done it before. Um, and he pretty much, as far as I could tell, he did his job, tried to do his, his job to the letter. Um, he handled me like I was, uh, you know, he basically just went through the checklist. It was, you know, when I had the one-on-one -on -one interview with him, he just went through his checklist. He asked me all those questions. And, uh, you know, like, like Jorge, I was in contact with, uh, with the, the, the local Mennonites in Germany. So these people had, had they had uh, other, besides the, I had the regulation on my own, but the Mennonites over there, they had other materials to help me prepare. So I knew every question he was going to ask before he knew. Um, so the only, the, the one place where I tripped up was I was just answering his questions like perfectly. <laughs> and so that was the one thing that he did that pissed me off was he, uh, he, his, he gave in his final opinion, he, he mentioned that he was certain that I had been coached, you know, by an outside group and that uh, we should, they should take that into consideration that, that I wasn't fully genuine, you know, because I had given all these uh, coached answers, you know. Um, but whatever, he was right about that. And I guess he was right to include that in his report that he observed that I had been coached or it seemed likely that I'd been coached. Um, but yeah, he seemed to just, he was just some guy who didn't want to do it. He wanted to get it over with as quick as possible and he didn't want to get in trouble, which is kind of how people operate in the military. Yeah. My, my investigating officer was a, like a, I don't know, kind of a, a guy on a witch hunt. Um, cause he, I'm not sure where he's from. Maybe, uh, I think another ROTC unit, but yeah, from the very first moment I met him, you know, you're called into the meeting with him and I asked to record the hearing, which you're allowed to do. Um, I had a tape recorder right there and he said, he said, no, um, you know, you, you, it's like a, you can hire someone to record it like a, like a court hearing, like a stenographer, but you can't record it with a tape recorder and give me a copy, <clears throat> which immediately I just, it, I just made me on guard because there was, you know, three of them kind of ganged up against me, my RDC commander, and then another captain, and then the investi investigating officer. And he kind of acted like, like a lawyer trying to, trying to get me on certain points. And by that time I was, I'd been seeing a, like a therapist, a counselor at school, because I was depressed about everything going on, you know, and he ended up in his um, summary, you know, basically accusing me of the crime of depression and accused me of fraudulently enlisting and recommended me for administrative action. And he did go so far as to say that he found my claim as conscientious objector convincing and everybody else did too, the chaplain, the psychiatrist, the, um, my letters of support were strong, but he, he just took it so personally that I was doing this. And he said that I should serve an example as an example and a warning to other RTC units when, you know, national guard members come knocking on their door, which isn't the case. Like RTC recruited me. Um, it, you know, it should be a warning that all these people are trying to get out of deployment and, you know, um, and then, yeah, basically said that they should take back any financial assistance they had ever given me, any tuition assistance, any wow. stipend, any bonus, everything. <laughs> like, he wanted me to pay back everything. Um, yeah, I get, like, demoted, and he won my case denied. And that's why I had to hire a lawyer at that point, because, I, I, you know, I couldn't fight it by myself. Did having Did having the attorney 
make it easier with dealing with them? Will it give you kind of a, a bit of a barrier there? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, you know, at that point I was like 20 or 21. So, you know, I, I composed a rebuttal, um, all the points that, that I thought I should say, but taking that to the lawyer and having him drafted in more legal language and in an official document and all that stuff. And I, I think they, I think it makes them notice a little more too, um, that you know, you're serious. They're, they can't just steamroll you and yeah. I have a lawyer. And the next lawyer I had to get, cause I moved to the Bay area once my case was finally denied, it, like it went all the way up to the top, took a year to do that. And then when it was denied, they said my options were I could en enlist in active duty immediately, commission as an officer, and then um, go to active duty or face administrative action. And you know, I, I said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing either of those things. So I had to hire a lawyer who was ready to sue the government on the writ of habeas corpus, which is, um, he said, so they denied you, but they can't just say, no, you're con not a conscientious objector. They have to give you a reason why you are not. And they didn't do that. That was the mistake that the investigative officer made in my case. He, you know, was tasked with um, trying to see if I was a true conscientious objector. And instead of doing that, he like, you know, went, went to in all these other areas and tried to, uh, you know, make me seem like a schmuck, which, you know, you already feel like a schmuck <laughs> half the time when you're a CEO, you like, at least for me, I feel very proud that I stood up against the war. And I also, you know, feel shame and guilt and about a lot of things too. No, that, that sounds like he showed his ass big time. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and what do you do in those circumstances? You know, if um, you know if if you hadn't been able to get a lawyer in that same spot, um, you know what what would how bad would that be for for I mean just just in different situations and stuff. And I'm really really thankful that you were able to do that and that the um, that's where he went going to court is that habeas corpus explained to us you've already told us this lady's a conscientious objector. Why is she still in the military? How is that that happening? And it, it, it sounds a little like that they were, you know, that they tried to hit the ball up into the air as much as they could until they knew it was going to hit the ground and then they finally let you leave. So. Hey, everyone. I really hope you're enjoying the podcast. But truth be told, I need your help. No, I don't need you to move a couch or borrow a leaf blower. No, I need you to hit pause on your podcasting app right now and share this episode with somebody you know, somebody who you might think might be receptive to it. It could be a, a friend or relative who's considering joining the military or a veteran you know who might be interested in, in hearing a little more truth in their news about uh, military and veterans. We rely on you all to help us reach as many people as possible. So please hit that pause button right now and share this episode with somebody. Sharing all done? Good? Okay, good deal. I know Uncle Al will cuss a lot listening to the episode, but he'll appreciate it when the cursing stops. Now I want to mention something about Patreon. We are always in the market for more Patreon supporters. So if you get the chance, please come out and support us. You could support us for as little as a dollar a month. And what do you get for your dollar, you ask? Well, you get a one-minute drop on any topic you choose once a month. Just email us your question or comment, and we'll give it the old Henry Danny breakdown on air. Guaranteed to have 60 seconds of our time. We may spend more on it. Um, uh, we prefer to do military and veteran topics, but whatever topic you think might be pertinent. And we may spend a whole bunch more time talking about it, depending on the topic. And for contributors, a bit north of a dollar a month, we have some bonus episodes, some essays of mine, and a few other things as well. We're still in the process of, of building our rewards, so if you have any suggestions for Patreon rewards, 
please let me know. Now, back to the podcast. Fortress on a Hill is expanding. We're going to start doing chapter series as part of our lineup. There are some topics that are simply too big and important to leave to discussing in a single headline. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank all of our honorary producers who are helping us do just that. We rely on the support of our patrons through Patreon to help keep the podcast a success. Thank you to Matthew Ho, Will RNs, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James Higgins, and James Obar. Anyone who contributes $10 or more a month on Patreon will be listed here as an honorary producer. And to all of our contributors on Patreon, thank you for helping us do this. Um, JJ, I'm, uh, we, uh, earlier you wanted to jump in. Yeah, no, I was just, I mean, thankfully I haven't had that much of an issue, um, with any kind of leadership having, you know, impeding the process or anything like that. Um, it was a little bit slow going up the chain of command as far as legal review or, and things like that. But, uh, my investigating officer, same as, as Clifton was, he was doing his job, doing it to the letter of the law, you know, trying to get it out of the, out of the way so he could progress his career or whatever. Um, the most, the most that I've gotten is, is from, uh, like the final legal review guys and I've never interacted with them, but their, their recommendations and all that are, are a little snarky and, and, um, wanting me to repay the, the West point, um, I guess debt, you know, recruitment, which is something that I'm, I'm working on the rebuttal on right now over the weekend. I'll turn it in next week before it goes to the department of the army review board. So other than that, it was pretty, you know, everyone was pretty much neutral about it. Um, a lot of the soldiers, I mean, like understood it because a lot of the soldiers, they, they joined the military for the economic stability, like they, nothing really else. Um, very few joined for like the hua hua, like, you know, the, the things you see in movies. Um, so they understood, a lot of them understood it. Um, and people at, you know, my peers and my commanders, they're just, you know, it's whatever, like, I'm just, it was just something else that someone else, you know, was going through. Um, so yeah, never, never really had too much of an issue, obviously, like, especially in that infantry battalion, when I started thinking about this, I did feel some of that, like people were looking down on me, but you know, <laughs> I was never meant to be in an infantry battalion in the first place. So. It wasn't a big deal. It's hard. It's it's hard when it's uh, the stronger the sense of community is, the harder it is to know that you're you're set out from them. You know that that it's not it's not the same. Um, all right, let me get to my uh, next question here. Sorry, I lost my spot. Okay, so we're we're in an age now where censorship of the military and of combat is a is a huge thing, and that unlike in the Vietnam era, word of mouth doesn't have the same power that it did. You know that the the Vietnam era anti war movement, you know they they worked in groups, but it wasn't you know we weren't on email lists. We didn't you know do a maybe maybe a phone tree I guess back in the day, but Um, these days in the age of drones, it requires far fewer pulls of the trigger to cause massive death. But that also means fewer eyes get to know what happened and potentially report it to someone. Add to that, the natural compartmentalization of the military, how, how, uh, you don't know what the other guy is doing, you know, the, whatever other parts of your unit are doing because you're doing your job. It's not your job to watch them. It's your job to do your job. And then how classification has changed things that these days 
Um, I've had several interviews with people who said that they find things that are embarrassing or insulting, but they don't need to be classified, but yet they're hidden away so that it doesn't make them look bad and consequently the army look bad. Um, Good examples of this would include like when the Bush administration forbid filming of returning American coffins during Operation Iraqi Freedom, which was an image that was very, very powerful and influential during Vietnam. And that actually got changed when Obama was elected. Um, My question for you guys, because you guys hold unique roles in the anti-war community, so to speak. um, How do you think the community can best use your guys' experience to inform how we fight for peace? Are there, are there, you know, that um, I mentioned when we first started that it's, it's um, most soldiers, most, most troops probably have never met a conscientious objector. Um, but people need to know about you guys. They need to understand it. They need to know that it's can be done, that people deserve the right to be heard and to have their morals vindicate them. Um, and, and, and it goes back to me earlier, what I mentioned about the army values is that I know I went in believing that the people in the military were trying to aspire to that. Like I was, that's not the case. Um, JJ, you mentioned earlier, you know, most people join for economic reasons, not for who would kill people reasons. Um, so what do you guys think? How best can the anti-war community get your guys' experiences to be helpful for the, the, the bigger thing? And I realize it's kind of a bigger question. I, it, it's, it's just kind of sh- shooting around ideas. But again, you guys have very unique experiences. Rosa, what you've been through, the delays that you went through, the treatment that you received, Clifton, the fact that you wouldn't have known anything had you not gotten that internet access and gotten that regulation. Um, JJ, I'm sure you can speak to being on YouTube and being, you know, and, and hearing people talk about their experiences, knowing that you're not alone, that what the process is. Um, but I think that you guys hold, hold a really unique place. And so I'd, I'd like to, you know, know how do you, how do you think we can best get that out there? Well, I mean, there's organ- you know, there's there's the GI rights hotline, which which does a seems to do a pretty decent job. I actually volunteered with them for a while when I first got out. When I first came home, that was '05, and in those days, they actually were receiving quite a few calls, and uh, I, I spoke with a bunch of people myself. And when, and when I was going through the process, I contacted them too. Um, and just, just to, you know, get more information and stuff. Really the main thing is, is information. If, if a young soldier or a young service member knows that they don't want to fight, they don't want to go kill, or they don't want to go back and do it again if they've already done it before in this day and age the you know, there's enough access to information is, is, uh, is not what it was back then. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot easier. I think, I assume from what I've, from what little I I pay attention to that people in the military have a lot more internet access now. So as long as the information is out there and there's some kind of supportive, you know, community out there and whatever's left of the anti-war movement, if there, it's not really a movement at the moment, I don't think, but there is a community. Um, so there's that. And, you know, there's tons of pod, there's tons of like veteran and even active duty uh, podcasts right now. And most of them, everyone that I've found is, is sort of anti-war. Uh, so maybe just, we, that's just keep doing that. <laughs> it's not going to, that doesn't hurt. No. Uh, make the inter- information available, you know? Yeah, I agree. I, I came across um, about face. Um, on t- on Twitter, I was only on Twitter like a couple months because I hate Twitter. <laughs> but it, it's amazing that all these groups are popping up and they're vocal. And um, to be honest, I had completely sealed myself off from any kind of veteran community. And if I found out that someone was a veteran, I certainly did not tell them my story. Um, but to see About Face, um, you know, tweeting all these you know, anti-war things, peace things, very political things. And they're, you know, veterans, veterans against the war. 
just knowing that that community was out there was, um, and I, of course I'd never gone looking for it <laughs> until recently because I just maybe wasn't ready, but um, it's awesome when you feel included. Um, one one thing I, do, I definitely wanted to mention is uh, is your podcast, Rosa, uh, Breaking Cadence, that the, um, I think I'm, I'm missing just a couple episodes now, but the, the really drawing out people's stories um, in that light and also contrasting it with your own. I've learned a lot from the four episodes of your podcast that I've listened to. And I hope that you continue that because you're going to find so many other stories, people that, you know, it's it, even stuff that after doing it for so long, it's like, wow, that was crazy. Um, but yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Thanks for listening. Yeah, no, I do. I, I really enjoy it. And, um, uh, I think that those are the, those are the most important things. And actually, you know, like, like Clifton mentioned, we now have, you know, four or five of us that do anti-war stuff in different ways and in different formats. And so, um, you know, I think that that is a, a really helpful thing for everybody so that they can, you know, we, we all lean to certain voices, certain uh, personalities. And so if, if we get information better from one source or another, but to have that community, like you said, to, I, I did the same thing for a while after I got out. I was, I, I didn't do any better in anything. And I fig, finally figured out it was because I didn't fit in at the VFW. I didn't fit in at DAV. I didn't fit in in a lot of these other organizations where we support veterans and we support the military. And that means we support war. And so, you know, I like, I'm, I'm, I think I'm still technically a member of, of the VFW. Um, but knowing like you said about face veterans for peace um that that these these organizations have really it's nice to have a sense of community it's nice to have a sense of belonging and to feel safe that you can share those opinions that in normal veteran circles isn't acceptable you know milvet twitter is a, usually a gross and horrible place to be for the most part i mean some of us are tweeting about the news or making fun of Ben Shapiro or whatever we happen to be doing on Twitter at that, uh, that given point in time. Um, but, uh, um, any other, any other resources, guys, any other, any other things you think the, uh, community can do? Uh, Ramon, I know you're there, man. I, I, uh, <laughs> how's it going? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. No, uh, uh, I've just been, uh, listening. Um, you know, obviously this, uh, this episode's about, uh, conscious objectors so I want to be here um, as someone who didn't um, who wasn't a conscious objector but you know looking back I wish I was um, you know to hear to support y'all's voices and to lift y'all up um, I think what we need to do um, I mean is is uh, start trying to have conversations with, uh, with with youth with students you know I remember in high school uh, the, the recruiters were always in there always talking to us I think that's the um, is to provide an alternative voice, an alternative like a worldview um, that discusses what the military actually does and, and what does it actually mean to be part of this uh, of, the, uh, of this force. Um, and so you have like uh, individual projects that people have, like there's Hart uh, in Austin who does uh, sustainable options for youth, where they go into the actual youth uh, into the high schools and and set tables up next to the recruiters and they, they, they provide information, you know, as far as like weighing all the options, what are the reasons for joining? Why don't, you know, what are these other alternatives that are available to you? You know, I joined um, in 01 purely out of economic necessity. You know, I was, uh, I had a daughter, I was married, I was fresh out of high school and, uh, and that was the, the option. I needed to provide a paycheck for my family. You know, if I would have known that I could have, you know, there was a, uh, you know, programs that were available in my community that, you know, were, you know, geared students towards trade schools and, and stuff like that. Uh, then I could have done that because college wasn't for me. Um, but, you know, I, I needed that paycheck. So I joined and, and, uh, and that was the only option that I saw. But, um, you know, looking back at it now, you know, joining because purely because of economic necessity um, doesn't negate the fact that I was uh, I was fighting for a paycheck at the expense of other people's communities. Right. Um, you know, being a part of the invasion of Iraq and, and, and all that. Um, so now, you know, with About Face Veterans Against the War and other, you know, 
community members, you know, allies, um, you know, it's our, it's our job to get out there into the community and have those conversations because I think everything is, is so, everything's online and it's, the information is readily available, but um, it's always good to, to have a face to talk to someone to actually have that conversation face to face and, and to, and to have, you know, the, to talk about topics that are difficult. Um, so I think being there in our community, uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, provide the information that's available um, is going to help, will help us out a lot. You, you reminded me of something that I wanted to mention for today. Um, and it has to do with guilt over overdoing certain things is um, Rosa, I think in, in your email, when we were emailing, um, you had mentioned about dealing with the guilt of still being affiliated with the military in some way, specific, like for me, it's the VA, um, you know, that the, the disability money that I get is because of my participation in something that I'm now ashamed of and trying to figure out how to feel about that. Um, and I think that, that that's where you guys will come in the most strongly is on trying to find sanity among conflicting views. You know, that there's a, even with leaving the military, even with not wanting to be in combat, you made friends, you know, so maybe if you went to combat with them, you made, you know, brothers and sisters. Um, Cause I do, I do still think that there's a, there's a, a friendship under fire that people don't get, but that's mostly stressful situations, not specific to combat. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, how do you do that? How do you accept that, you know, you might not work again and your sustenance comes from the, one of the sources of your pain? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to make friends in the military, like, especially in training and well, that's all, you know, that I know. Cause I never, I never served in a war zone, but it's so easy to identify and laugh with and, and like your peers until, you know, conversation turns to politics. And then you're just like, yeah, who am I talking to? Um, and yeah, yeah, that's what's so heartbreaking about it. It's like you, you have so much in common with these people and then so much, you just can't understand how they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a really hard pill to swallow. And, um, you can, I, th I think you, <laughs> you just got to let leave time with it, I guess, but it's a, it's a very hard pill to swallow. You know, with my, you know, my experience, we were, we were all totally ignorant of politics. We were apolitical. None of us voted. I was one of the only enlisted people who voted and we were uh, on a training exercise out in, in Germany in the field at the time. So it was very difficult to vote. And that was when uh, John Kerry tried to run against George Bush. So I sent in my absentee ballot for John Kerry. It was very difficult to vote. Um, but I will say there was, you know, as we, as time went on and we started to see, you know, we all kind of, all of us who had been there knew that the war was wrong. And so at that point it was just like, well, are you going to be okay with doing something that's wrong or not? And of course, yeah. most of us, unfortunately, were uh, decided that they would, they were going to just go along with something that was wrong which is human nature uh, when you're faced with the army. Um, uh, but, but I have to say there was a, there was a, there was a sort of a core group of us who were a little bit more serious about, you know, a lot of us did get out. And unfortunately, most of the guys I know who were politically conscious and were, who were, you know, in, in touch with their morals enough to want to actively get out of the military, the way they did it was by using a bunch of drugs and getting caught. And several of my friends did that um, on purpose to get out. Um, just failed the urinalysis tests one after the other until they got bad conduct discharges. One of these uh -huh. guys was a friend of mine. He was discharged just for using cannabis. As he, he pissed hot uh, several times in a row and got a bad conduct discharge, I'm pretty sure. And he actually had, uh, was awarded the Purple Heart during our deployment. He was a medic, and he was in, a, in an M113 that rolled over a couple anti-tank mines. And one of the guys, the driver of the 113 was killed 
and uh, he had a purple heart for getting wounded and a bronze star for dragging the dead body out of the of the burning 113 and 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 doing he did first aid on everybody and stuff as he was wounded himself anyhow and he wound up getting a bad conduct discharge that's just one of several of my friends who did that and because that was you know we were in a painful place we were depressed um of course and we knew that if we got busted using drugs you could go home um I was using drugs myself too, but I made sure I didn't get caught because I wanted to get out with an honorable discharge. And, uh, and so, yeah, now I, I do, I collect a, a modest check from the VA for PTSD and tinnitus and I have a busted nose and this, that, and the other. Um, the way that I get over that conflict, my dogs are being really loud right now. Sorry. It's the awesome. way that I get around any kind of, feeling of guilt or whatever about that any kind of conflicted feelings y'all better go you have to go away go <laughs> go on any is basically i honestly feel without a shred of um without a shred of, of second thought that you know the the department of defense probably owes me about a billion bucks for what i did and this little six hundred dollars a month you know that's nothing Um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, there is, uh, that more, the, you know, that, that moral injury of the, the fact that, you know, I helped or I participated in the, the invasion of a, of a country destroying its infrastructure and, you know, causing enormous amounts of damage and, and, and death, um, that now like something that I'm uh, absolutely against and then now getting, you know, disability for it is, is something that I've come to terms with. I can't question that as far as like, uh, I can only try and like work uh, like every day to try and, and right the wrongs um, of participating and not standing up and not even realizing it because, you know, I was, you know, we weren't political, like, hearing all these uh, after the fact like that there was like the largest march and or largest protest in history against the Iraq war. I mean, I was at Camp Pendleton and I didn't hear not one thing about a march or anti-war and nothing like that. Cause we were so insular. It was just our, you know, our unit we're getting ready to deploy and everybody's excited. Like, yeah, we're going to go overseas. And um, it's only until you get there until you see the destruction, you start to see it, you start to question. Um, so now it's like, I use my, my time, um, you know, each day trying to, 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 to work um, as best as I can to create a better world. And, you know, I'm hoping that uh, at one point in the future that I'm able to, like, be able to sustain myself without having to rely on my disability um, and be able to, like, donate my disability entirely for, um, uh, uh, to good causes, you know, not something that, uh, that, that that's going to be for me, you know, um, so I, I'm hoping that's my, my goal at some point is to be able to like flip that to where I'm financially stable, um, that I don't need the disability money and that that, that goes uh, to, to, to furthering good causes uh, to help our, our society. Um, yeah. It's a great, uh, that's a great goal, brother. It really is. Um, something I wanted to mention, uh, Clifton, going back to you talking about your buddies trying to get caught uh, using. Um, I worked for almost two years as a, as a drug investigator when I served. I was an MP and it was, uh, you could get attached to the CID office there at Fort Lewis and, and you would talk to people who is taught on UAs and the occasional, you know, drug dealer, like soldiers become big drug dealers. But mm -hmm. um, the thing that I learned the most from going through that process was hearing about how people who had been downrange were medicating with these substances. And I heard it so much that, um, to include one guy who actually told me that he tried to kill himself. And, but it, it, it really crystallized in my view about the, the weight that we had all come back with. And to me, I was even reminded me of the weight that I was ignoring. Um, you know, that it took me years after getting out before I started to question roles, question uh, bigger parts of the machine, you know. But um, I tried to listen as much as I could when I was, when I was an investigator. 
um, when I when I started knowing that people were were hurting so much and still in uniform. And uh, Clifton, you mentioned a guy that you know he he uh, did did it a whole bunch just to get it done. And uh, we had a guy who I think he had like nineteen hot urinalysis tests for uh, for THC for marijuana. And uh, we always laughed about it. That made us in the office laugh. Uh, it's like, this guy clearly doesn't want to be in the military anymore. But you had other people in there too. The other one that was really hard to stomach was when guys would tell you that they were using on the outside. They told their recruiter. The recruiter told them to lie. And now they were someone with a substance abuse problem in the military. And I had to treat them like a criminal, you know, in the, in the drug world, you know, there, there aren't specifically victims. The victim is the state or the people that use the drugs. Um, but I, I, I think about that sometimes. And, um, but I'm re- I'm grateful that I went through it because I wouldn't have had all that time to consider everything that I did and everything I participated in. Um, but that really told me the state of affairs for guys trying to deal with PTSD at the time. Their best option, 04, 05, 06, right in there, was to medicate, get in trouble and get out, ask for help and possibly get some help or possibly be ostracized because it's weakness of some kind. So... All right, guys. Um, so to close us out today, um, and we already talked about a few of them, I'd like to, if you guys have any organizations um, that have resources for COs, um, anything that you want to recommend, and if you don't remember it right now, you can email it to me. I'll throw it in the show notes. Um, but uh, the places and people that were most helpful to you when, uh, with your process. Yeah, well, I mentioned earlier the Quaker House out of uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay. And I've got their their number here. Um, okay. Go go ahead. The number is 919-663-7122. And these are the folks that like basically held my hand from beginning to now in my conscientious objective process. And they've made sure that I'm doing the right things and going according to regulations. So they've helped a lot. And- Let me say the number one more time. Yep, that number is 919-663-7122. And I actually got in contact with them through calling the GI Rights Network first. Okay. So I know Clifton mentioned them. Yeah, they, they're, I, I think that they should be kind of first stop, one stop shopping for people and kind of help them find resources that are better for them. And also some places may be full. Some places may not have resources, but others might. So go, go ahead. Well, yeah, the GI Rights Hotline, I've got it pulled up. That's one eight seven seven four four seven four four eight seven, And their website is girightshotline.org. You can easily, you know, they got the number right there at the top if you pull it up. And if you call them, usually you, you'll, you'll leave a message. It'll go to a local call center the way it worked when I was volunteering, and you'll leave a message with your number and what – your issue is, and they'll call you back. Another really good resource is the, um, uh, I've, I've pulled up the Department of Defense and Office of Inspector General. They have a hotline you can call. Um, hell, I can't, I'm not seeing it right now, but it's, it's not difficult to find. I think I'll, if you're, I'll, I'll Google it and throw it in there. Yeah. And, and based on your branch, I believe each, each branch has a, has a, um, Inspector General office. So I was always calling the local, um, IG office for the army in Germany over there. Um, and they, you know, they, the thing that they're most useful that I found them in those days, most useful for is if you're getting like undue heat, if somebody's harassing you, who's outranks you and they're, they're violating rules or whatever, at least the IG will contact your chain of command and put heat back on them. And usually uh, it's almost always enough to make them stop. Uh, so you'll get some relief that way. And then really the final resource, it's almost cliche, but JAG, the Judge Advocate General, the, the damn Army lawyers. When things got really bad for me and that, that acting first sergeant was really harassing me and obstructing me, 
when he actually started lying about me and getting, he got some junior, um, some junior NCOs to, to file false sworn statements against me and stuff. When all that started happening, um, I went right down to JAG and uh, explained what was going on. And, and the JAG people actually already knew that my unit was a shit storm and was doing this kind of stuff. And they put serious pressure on him. And actually, uh, that acting first sergeant got in a world of trouble over, over uh, that issue. Cool. Um, and wound up not actually not getting promoted to first sergeant over it, for example. So uh, JAG is actually, at least in my experience, they actually were honest, honorable people who were, who were trying to do the right thing. Uh, two more that I'd like to mention, the Center on Conscience. Okay. Um, I know the GI Rights Hotline has been referring some people there to do CO applications. And I was listening to an interview, um, the director or head of that, uh, she said that they had a 100% success rate on CO apl applications. Wow. Um, yeah, so that <laughs> if you're going to be a CO, like definitely hit them up. Um, and then Code Pink, uh, Code Pink helped me out. Um, I I ran into them at the height, kind of the height of my CO application mess when the investigating officer had just um, given his report. And it's them, they connected me with a lawyer in my area to do my rebuttal. Um, so code, those Code Pink ladies have some resources and are connected to lawyers. Yeah, and I would say the same for like the other outside organizations like Veterans for Peace and uh, I guess About Face, which used to be Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, definitely, and, and maybe Veterans for Peace is a little bit more widespread, I think. And so if there is a, a chapter around you, um, or even if it's not around you, if you contact them, you'll usually get a response and somebody who's knowledgeable who wants to help. Yeah, this is uh, for Mom. Um Another organization that's out there is called uh, Courage to Resist. Um, uh, they primarily hit support uh, countries' objectives that, are, that have gone public, uh, but they provide resources for anybody that's interested in, in being a CEO, and, and they try and connect people to a... Uh, they, they come, they come the, their approach is a little bit different. Uh, they're a project of the, uh, of the Objector Church. It's an interfaith, non-denominational non uh, peace and justice community that's uh, rooted in like religious humanism. Um, so they uh, uh, they support um, you know a, lo a lot of the uh, public uh, like very prominent um, countries and objectors, but they have all kinds of resources. So check out their website at Courage to Resist. Um, yeah. All right. I think uh, I think we got a good mix here. So, um, so I want to thank you guys for uh, being here today. It's been a, a great, great education for me, and I'm sure it will be for, uh, for all our listeners. Um, and, uh, yes, thanks for, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for nice talking you. to you all. Thanks uh, for, for coming on. Good being here. <laughs> We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill you can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at FortressOnAHill.com iTunes Stitcher SoundCloud Patreon Spotify you name it almost anywhere you listen we're already waiting for you and hey we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters please consider becoming a contributor at Patreon.com if you're not into doing a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple of bucks on PayPal. The link for that is in the show. Skepticism song. is one's best armor. Never forget that. You'll see it. Pay attention. I will not.